our message, of course, is watch your mouth, or watch your mouths. In the passage that we read just a moment ago, and I mentioned last week that I heard that if once a million times over the course of my life, usually from my mother or my father or a combination of both in concert and in tandem, watch your mouth, boy. But Paul kind of does the same thing in verse 29 of Ephesians chapter 4. In chapter 4, verse 29, the Apostle Paul, in saying, watch your mouth, condemns harmful, harmful words. Let no unwholesome talk proceed, come out of your mouths. But secondly, in verse 29, we find that Paul condemns, or rather commends, the use of helpful words. He says there in verse 29, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, in order that we might benefit those who listen. The church, in other words, is to be a place and is to be a people that would foster an environment where seldom is heard a discouraging word. And the skies are not cloudy all day. <laughs> in other words, we as God's people are to enunciate encouraging, helpful words. Paul says in verse 29, we're to enunciate and speak helpful words to persons. He refers to persons as others, as those in verse 29. 29. We often speak to fence posts. We often speak in frustration to telephone poles. But Paul says here that we are to specifically direct our speech to people in a way and in a manner that is helpful. We could say in a way or manner that is fit for the occasion or proper to the occasion would be an accurate, very literal translation. Paul's words are much in line with what we find in Throughout the Bible, for example, in Proverbs chapter 15, verse 23, the Bible says a man finds joy in giving an apt reply, and how good is a timely word. In Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11, the Bible says that a word aptly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. And it's incumbent upon us as God's people to speak in this way, to speak in this manner to speak words that are right and appropriate for the moment. And that means if we're going to speak words that are right for the moment, that are proper to the occasion that we have to, with empathy, engage in an undertaking that is motivated by a desire to understand, to understand other people, to understand where they are, to understand where it is that they're coming from. And that, dear brothers and sisters, is very difficult sometimes and very hard. How in the world do we do that? How in the world do we engage in such an undertaking? We do so by listening. Listening is hard, hard work, isn't it? It's sometimes just hard to, to screw ourselves down and to sit contently and to sit uh, patiently, listening, engaging other people, allowing them to talk and allowing them to speak and opening our ears as wide as we possibly can to entertain the words that they are speaking, oftentimes genuinely and sincerely. It's sometimes hard to sit still. It's sometimes hard to control your mind, isn't it? Because sometimes when somebody's speaking, your mind is going in a million and one different directions. And you're hearing the words, but the words really aren't computing. And so once they've said something, you say something in reply, and they'll say something like, well, I, 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 just, I just mentioned that a moment ago. And you feel embarrassed and a little bit uncomfortable, don't you? But that's how we sometimes roll, isn't it? Yes. Listening is very difficult, very hard work. Listening can be burdensome. Listening can be bothersome. But according to what Paul says in this particular passage, if we are to fulfill the passage literally and in spirit, then we have to do the bothersome thing, the burdensome thing. We ought to engage in the hard work of listening to other persons and to other people. That's the only way that we can speak a word that is appropriate or fit to the specific occasion, right? Otherwise, we're just shooting words off. Words that are not aimed and words that are not pointed and words that are not conditioned by the context of the, of the conversation. 
So we have to settle ourselves down, and we have to hook up in mind if what comes out of our mouths is going to make any sense and have any real meaningful bearing on the conversation on the issue at hand as the result of the conversation that you're having with another person. Now, why in the world would, be, would we be interested in doing the hard thing, the burdensome thing, the bothersome thing of sitting still and engaging our mind as other people, as other people communicate with us? There are, are two things that we could mention that might give us some motivation, some impetus to pay attention and to listen and then to speak appropriate and proper words, words that are fit for the occasion. A couple of things. Number one, the others and those that Paul refers to in verse 29 are image bearers. The others and those are valuable. They are of eternal worth for they have been created in the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They've been created in the image of God. The people that are speaking that are formulating thoughts and that are enunciating those thoughts with their mouths are eternal souls that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the trouble to live for and die for. They are the people that the Lord Jesus Christ went to the trouble to save. So if Jesus would leave the glory of heaven and come to this earth for us, to redeem us, to restore into our hearts and lives the blessedness and the beauty of God's image in us. If he would go to the trouble, if you will, to do such a thing, then it seems to me the least we can do is to stop, is to love, is to listen, and to learn. Right? Amen. The others which he refers, those are people created in the image of God. So we do the hard thing. We engage in the, in the hard work. We do the burdensome and we do the bothersome because the burdensome and the bothersome are people created in God's image. They are image bearers, but we have to keep in mind that they are need bearers as well. And we all need somebody to lean on. Don't we? To borrow a line from Bill Withers back in the day. We all need somebody to lean on. And you know what? As brothers and sisters in Christ, we have been given the responsibility in a very clear way to lean on one another. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Didn't Jesus say, love your neighbor as yourself? We love in action. We love in deed. But we can also love and show our love, our patient, passionate love, by opening our ears and by opening our hearts and taking on, as it were, at least in part, the burdens and the bothers that belong to someone else's heart and that are particular to someone else's life. At least in part, that's what Paul meant when he said, bear one another's burdens. We can't always do that physically, can we? I, I, I told my brother the other day, he was just, he said, I'm, I'm down to my last nerve. Some of you may not know, but he's, he's had a heart transplant, he went home from the hospital, was home for a week after being in the hospital for two months suffering a stroke on top of the heart transplant. Went home from the hospital for a week, had to go back to the hospital for another two weeks because of bacteria that had built up around the valves of his heart. Uh, things were really touch and go at that point. But you know what? I prayed, many of you prayed, and you know what? He, he, he got better. And we were grateful for that. It was like I say, touch and go. And it was really a miracle, according to the doctors, that one, he survived the stroke. And that two, he survived this onslaught of infection that set up shop in his body in some very, very serious places. Went home from that and uh, was home for about five or six days, five days, baby, and, and, and began to have seizures. 
bad, bad seizure. So they had to rush him to back to North Carolina uh, via ambulance. And he was in the hospital for another two weeks and got to go home this past Thursday. But it was while he was in the hospital this last time <coughs> that he said, I'm down to my last nerve. I just don't know how much more I can take. And I told him, in all sincerity, if, you, if, if I could take it, just a portion of it, and bear it for you, I would. In a heartbeat. He said, I, I know you would. But it's enough that I can call and talk to my big brother. And to know that he's going to listen and to know that he's going to be praying for me. We can't enter into their experience. And say, well, Rick, I'll take a part of that infection. Or say, Rick, I'll tell you what, instead of you having multiple seizures, I'll at least take one of them for you. Now, that would be a, a, a real and tangible way to enter into experience, wouldn't it? And to share and to bear and what it is that a person might indeed be going through. But we cannot do that as much as sometimes we would want to. We cannot. So how do we do it? How do we bear each other's burdens? By pausing it. Putting the brakes on. Opening the heart. And opening the ears. And saying, regardless of what it might be. Regardless of what's going on in our lives at the time. Sometimes I just have to consciously say, you know what, whatever this is, it will wait. There have been times when it's called, I'm thinking, you know what, I really don't have the time right now. I'm kind of busy, kind of tied up. But I've got to pause it. I've got to put it on the back burner. And I'm going to I'm gonna have to listen. And that's what we have to do. We have to do the hard work. We have to engage people in their context and in their place of life, motivated by love for people who bear great needs. And I don't know about you, but for me, this brings incredible clarity to the way that we're supposed to live the Christian life, at least in part. We have responsibilities, and this, I don't know about you, but this clarifies the reality of it for me. At least in part, as God's people, we are to be there, are we not? To listen, to love, and to learn to show empathy, meaning entering into the experience. Why? Because there are need bearers all around us. We roll into this place with our Sunday smiles, don't we? You do. And I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you, I do too. You think everything's always good with, with me because I just kind of naturally, just kind of naturally smile. I just, that's just how I roll and how I've always rolled. Just smile. And why not? The Lord's on the throne. He is good and gracious. He is sovereign over all. But we still have our burdens and bothers, don't we? And I've had my share of them these last few months. There's no question about that. You take life circumstances and couple that with the frustrations and the difficulties and the struggle with COVID and how to pastor a church in the midst of COVID-19. It's, it's been a ride. There's no, there's no doubt about that. But let's face it, no matter what we put on here, and I think it's better to put it on than not, really, I mean, if, if, if you have the option of frowning or smiling, which is the better option, right? You know, my take on it is I, I, can, I, can, I can cry in the closet, you know. I can, I can cry in the closet and be, be weepy in the closet. But let's face it. We all have needs. We ought to be concerned about not only our needs, but about the needs of, of other people. I, I love what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones 
said in this regard. He said, my dear Christian people, there are weary people round and about us. People weary of sin, people weary in sin, people weary of life. There are Christian people around us carrying burdens, carrying loads, suffering illness and sickness, disappointment, the treachery of friends, some fond hopes suddenly gone, dashed, and vanished illusions. There are men and women around us and about us who are weary. And as we meet them and speak to them, let us forget ourselves. And let us not regard the meeting as an occasion when we can display how wonderful we are God forbid. Let us pray that we may be enabled to speak a word in season to some poor, weary soul. Our Lord came from heaven to do that, and of him it was written. He verified it in his life. A bruised reed he shall not break, and the smoking flax he shall not quench. That is the way for us also. And as we travel through this journey of life, we are to help men and women by a word. A word of encouragement, a word of cheer, perhaps a word of rebuke, but a word that will remind them that they are under God and that if they are in Christ, they are precious to him. Let us go out, therefore, to succor the weary, to help the infirm. Let us indeed help one another in the whole of our life and conversation, but above all, let us help one another in our speech. As we speak helpful words. Let us be mindful that these helpful words are to be directed to persons. But let us also be mindful that uh, the fact that these helpful words are also to be enunciated and spoken with a purpose. As we speak, Paul says, let us speak only what is helpful for the building up of others that it may benefit those who listen. Is Paul saying there that we're to never criticize or never correct anybody under any circumstances for any reason? And the answer is absolutely not. That's not what this verse means. There are times when reproof is absolutely appropriate. There are times when criticism, constructive criticism, there are times when correction is absolutely appropriate. But when we speak words being obligated to do so by some situation that confronts us, when we speak those words of reproof and rebuke, we do so with a holy purpose. The Apostle Paul has already defined that holy purpose for us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, where he has told us already that we are to be about the business of speaking the truth in love. Wherever we speak, whenever we speak, for whatever reason we speak, it is always to be motivated by love. And it's always to be truthful. In other words, there is a way in which Christians are to communicate. We're to communicate truthfully. Verse 25, Paul says, put away speaking lies, but be sure that you make every effort to speak truthfully to one another. We're always to speak to one another graciously. We're always to speak to one another lovingly. When you stop and think about it, this is exactly how the Lord has communicated his purposes unto us. You listen to the speech of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels, and you'll see that the Lord Jesus Christ communicated truthfully. He always spoke the truth. Never once did he speak a lie. Never, ever did the Lord Jesus Christ prevaricate from the truth. He always spoke truthfully. His words were always spoken lovingly, and his words were always spoken graciously. The end game of truthful words, loving words, gracious words, of course, was the salvation of our souls. And sometimes he had to tell the truth, the hard truth, about our situation and about our circumstances. He did so, for example, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. You know that verse, don't you? Most of us... All of us know that verse, perhaps. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of, no, 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 for all have sinned. I was just throwing you a curveball there. I wouldn't have had a mental lapse, a, a glitch in thought at all. Would I? Would never, that never happened to me. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, that sounds like a harsh word. To me, some might say, 
How, how, how kind and gracious and loving is it for somebody to say to you, you are nothing short of a rotten, filthy, undeserving, wayward, and wicked sinner. And in so many words, that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Of everybody, I love the fact that he's an equal opportunity offender, <laughs> that he leaves nobody out, right? All have sinned, whether Jew or Gentile. And that encompasses every person that has breathed or that is breathing or that will breathe. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is the absolute truth spoken from a heart of absolute love. We have to know the bad spoken in love before the good spoken in love and truth means anything whatsoever. For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how the Lord spoke. That's how his inspired writers speak to us even today. Kindly and lovingly and graciously with the end game. You see, the words of Christ, the words of Scripture, they have a purpose and an intention, don't they? And the intention is always good. And the intention is always positive. If salvation is the end game, that's a good thing, isn't it? <coughs> Most certainly it is. So it's no wonder that we're encouraged. It's no wonder that we're instructed to speak in the same way. In love and in grace. By the way, by grace, we're saved by it. By grace, we live in it. And by grace, according to Paul, we are to speak according to it. No wonder in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, the apostle said, Let your conversation, let your speech always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you might know how to answer every word. What kind of words are grace words? Grace words are caring words. Grace words are constructive words. Grace words are helpful words. Grace words are healing words. And these words, these grace words, according to our text, are words that are intended to do two things. Paul says, this is how you ought to speak. Speak helpful words. Now he gets to the point of where he tells us why we ought to speak helpful words to other people. Helpful homes to one another, and the helpful words to one another in the church. Helpful words to one another in the home, etc. You get the idea. Words that, as Paul says in the passage, build. Speak only what builds others up. The word literally means to edify or to encourage. The exact opposite of damage or destroy. Words are powerful. We know that to be true. And words can either uplift or they can really, really, really deflate. They can bring us up. Or they can bring us way, way down. Sometimes it can be a sentence consisting of many words. Sometimes it can be one word. Doesn't matter. If they're intended to damage and intended to destroy and intended to deconstruct, they can surely do that. Quickly and most surely, most surely, and most surely. But a helpful word intended to build can be used by God in the most incredible way to bring encouragement to the hearts of people in need. I heard the story about a little boy who was leaning up against the outside wall of a store one Christmas season. He's standing out there shivering, and a woman walked up to him and put her arm around him and asked him the question, are you cold? He responded, I was cold until you spoke to me. What kind of word did she speak? A helpful word, an encouraging word that served to build up the heart and the spirit of the shivering little boy in the cold. We're to speak grace words, words that build, words that encourage, words that edify. 
and strengthen the life of the person to whom we speak. Words that build are grace words that you and I as God's people should speak, but words that benefit are words that God's people, that you and I should speak as well. Paul says that we ought to speak words that give grace to those who hear us, imparting grace and benefit to those who listen. I would call and I would suggest is Jesus speak. What kind of words did Jesus speak? He spoke gracious words, didn't he? In Luke chapter 4, verse 22, the Bible said that all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. You know why they held him in high regard? There are a lot of reasons, perhaps, why they held him in high regard, but one of the reasons, well, anybody's going to raise the dead and what have you, would be held in high regard and those kinds of things. That's what I mean. You're pretty impressed with it. But you've got to admit, this is Luke chapter 4. We had not yet gotten to that stuff. He's in the temple, and he's, he's speaking and he's teaching. And he's telling them about the Father and about the Father's purposes being fully realized in God the Son. And the people were impressed. Not yet by what it was he was doing because he wasn't yet doing that stuff that we point to. Walking on water, raising the dead, putting somebody's ear back on that had been cut off. Casting out a demon into a, 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 a herd of pigs. Those are impressive things, and I would think pretty highly of somebody like that, wouldn't you? But we're not there yet. Why were they thinking well of him? I'll tell you why. Because he was taking the truth of God, his truth, and applying it to the overarching plan of God. And applying it to the predicament of the human condition. When he came and he taught, what did he say? I have come to set the captive free. They're bound that I have come to fulfill the words of Isaiah. That in me you will find freedom. And in me and through me you will be able to live at liberty. He spoke to a people who were like sheep without a shepherd, and he is the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, the great shepherd, had come to set them free and to lead them beside quiet waters. That's what, that's why he came. And that's what he talked about in that temple. And the people were impressed with what he had to say. Because his words were not words of condemnation. They were good words. They were gracious words. They were words that were immersed in mercy. And words that were full of grace and truth. And they all thought well of him. You know, it's true. People think well or poorly of us. Oftentimes, by what we say. Let me ask you, do you draw conclusions? Say, for example, you meet somebody for the first time, and do you draw conclusions about that person? Because you don't have anything else to base conclusions on, do you? Because you haven't seen them in action. You haven't watched them grow. So in that moment of conversation you have with them, you've sized them up by virtue of perhaps how they look. Let's just face it. I can only imagine what people think of me wandering around Walmart in my tattered shorts and my cut off sleeve t-shirt. I can only imagine. I don't know what they think. Because we'll be talking and they'll just kind of act one way as we're talking and then They'll ask me what I do. Well, I'm Pastor First Baptist Lexington. Oh, well, well, excuse, excuse me, sir. I'm just, it ain't no big deal when you come down to it. It's a big deal that I get to do this, but I put my britches on just like everybody else one leg at a time. It's no, no big deal. So we might size somebody up 
by appearance, but we will certainly draw conclusions about what they say during the course of conversation, won't we? Seems like a nice guy. Seems like a good old boy. Seems like a good old gal. Or maybe not. But when Jesus talked, wherever he was, to whomever he was speaking, he always spoke loving, kind, merciful, good, edifying, hopeful, helpful words. Truthful words. And they all spoke well of him. So if we're going to be like him, and I don't know about you, but I think that's our one holy ambition, is it not? I mean, it's the Father's purpose to conform us to the image of his Son. The Bible's very, very clear about that. We have been, we have been saved for that purpose and reason, that we might be conformed to the image of the Son, Romans chapter 8. So we ought to have some interest in what God's interested in, wouldn't you think? And if we happen to, if indeed we do, then we're going to have to come to the place to where we say, all right, I'm going to watch my mouth. I'm going to avoid harmful words. And by the Spirit's help, by the Spirit's enablement, I'm going to speak helpful words, words that encourage, words that cheer, words that comfort, words that stimulate. I'm going to be a purveyor of those kind of words. Even thumper. Y'all remember Thumper from Bambi? I'm not going to emulate Thumper's cute little, I couldn't. But I will say what Thumper said. If you can't say something nice, don't say nothing at all. And that kind of gets to the heart of it, at least gets close to it. And I trust that by the grace of God and with the help of the Lord, for the good of others, for the good of others, and the glory of Jesus Christ, may we watch our mouth and speak not hurtful words, harmful words, but helpful words. Let's pray together. Our blessed and holy Lord, we thank you ever so much. And we bless you ever so much for such a clear and honest word. We don't have to guess or go about trying to figure out what you're trying to say. Our responsibilities and the reality of those are so very clear. And now, Lord, they are incumbent upon us. And I pray that in every possible way that we as your people could traffic in words that help and words that heal instead of words that hurt. And words that harm. And Lord, is, and Lord, let us mark ourselves as distinct from the world. Lord, if we'll just speak in the way that Christ Jesus spoke. But Lord, we will set ourselves up as radical and revolutionary. Because this kind of thing is not the way of the world. It's not the way the world speaks. It's certainly not the way the world acts. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to act and to live in such a way that others are blessed and that your name is, is glorified and honored and praised. Father, if there's someone here this morning that's never trusted in Christ as Savior, we ask and pray that they today might turn from their sins and trust in the one who alone can save. Father, if there are others who have other decisions of other kinds, perhaps to rededicate a life, perhaps to unite with this church, Father, whatever it might be, we ask and pray that you would seal the deal and that you would, Lord, close the deal and accomplish and bring to fruition the work that you've begun within them. Lord, we love you and honor you and praise you and thank you for being a good and gracious God, a kind and benevolent king. We pray in Jesus' name.